the Coastway Church, good to see each and every one of you. Believe it or not, when we are sent out of this place today, we will have finished this journey of joy through the book of Philippians as we close up chapter 4. This is the sixth book of the Bible that we've taught verse by verse through in a little over three years. We're deeply committed to God's Word, and that's why we like to go through books of the Bible. But if you think about it, 104 verses in Philippians. Four chapters. This will be the 13th sermon. Many uh, breakthrough community group discussions that have happened over the course of this journey, and we're so grateful. It's good just to, to round out this time by being reminded of the great theme of Philippians. What is it? Well, it is joy in Jesus, and joy is settled delight no matter what you're feeling or facing. And we're going to press into that a little bit more today, but the reason why we called the series Gain and Glory is because by joy in Jesus, all loss could actually be counted as gain, and all of the glory is due to Jesus' name. And so what we're going to do next week is this is all intended to just slingshot us into what we're calling a day of prayer and worship. We do this a few times a year, and this is coming next Sunday. And so we're going to rejoice in the truths. We're going to rejoice in all that we have received and learned and how it's shaped us over Philippians uh, with an extended time of prayer, with an extended time of, of ministry through song and scripture. So I hope you'll be here next week for that. It's always so very special. Well, we're in Philippians chapter 4, uh, by the way, and let me just set it up with this way. Victoria and I's first date. Let me tell you a little bit about what uh, was going on. This was early 2011. We celebrated our 13th wedding anniversary in October. And let me just kind of let you know what the dynamic was. Uh, Victoria was driving. I showed up to our first, <laughs> our first date, and uh, we met at the Asheville Mall and ended up riding together to where we were going from there. But she was driving, a t at the time, a, a nicer, newer car than me. It was a 2009 Toyota Camry, which yours truly is currently driving today. It's paid off, baby, so we love it. <laughs> and so it looked a little different when she pulled up to our first date with that. But I actually showed up, uh, not, much st not many style points, all right? 1996 Forest Green Mercury Sable. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Uh, who remembers the car that they were driving when they met their spouse, okay? It's, you know, just a going, going back, married couples, but uh, not much to desire in terms of what I was driving. It got me from A to B, but sometimes, actual footage, it would turn off whenever I would stop at a, a stoplight, and I'd, I, it didn't phase me. I was used to it. I just, like, turned the engine back on, but other people were like, panic, panic. Uh, it would turn off, and the rear passenger uh, door, the paneling, would fall off if you opened it. So I just said, stay away from that door. We don't need anything out of there anyway. And uh, yet, for some reason, Victoria was not phased. She still liked me. She still dated me. She still married me, thank God. She was more concerned about what was driving me than what I was driving uh, fellas in the room, this is the type of woman that you want, single guys, right? Uh, single ladies, you need to focus more about who he is than what he has. And the reason why I share this is because Victoria cared more about who I was than what I had, and that's the nature of a content heart. And our goal as disciples uh, of Jesus is to come to a place where we say, Jesus is enough for me. Not all the extra stuff, all the bonuses that he might give to me. That's not why I'm coming to Jesus. I come to Jesus for Jesus. Jesus is enough for me. And when we can honestly say that as a Christ follower, when we can honestly say that as community groups together and as a church, here's what we know. We know that we're learning contentment. It's such a beautiful thing. And that's our topic for today. We're talking about contentment. And I just want to say that up to now in Philippians, we're coming to the close, uh, Paul has not ex explicitly mentioned contentment anywhere, but he's modeled contentment everywhere. Chapter 1, he says this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. In other words, whether I live or die, I'm content. Chapter 2, he says, I want to put others ahead of myself. In other words, in Christ, I'm content. He's given me all I need, so I can just give. 
chapter 3, my whole life is about actively and aggressively marching toward Christ because in Christ I'm content. And then chapter 4, we see there's conflict all around and I can't control a whole lot when it really comes down to it, but I have the, the, the peace of God to, to guard me and I've got the God of peace to guide me. And so in Christ I am content. And I just want to define, what are we talking about when we say contentment? Well, here's contentment. You may want to write this down. It's the peace of Christ that transcends what you do or don't have. The peace of Christ that transcends what you do or don't have. And here's the question on the floor. Is Jesus enough for you? Or do you feel as if you really deep down need something bigger or better than Jesus in order to be happy or to be content? Do you, do you think that Jesus plus nothing truly equals everything? Or if you were really leveling with your heart's intent, would you say Jesus plus something that he might give to me is what would equal everything? Well, I, I just want to pinpoint what's going on with our sinful condition and our, our human hearts is that when, when God and his provision are not a, enough for us, it, it harkens back to Eden whenever that sneaky snake deceived Adam and Eve and led them to believe this lie that God was not enough. They needed more than his presence and his provision. And when we do that, it's what the Bible calls coveting. Now, what is coveting? Well, coveting, it's a broken desire that drives you to discontent and resent. It's a broken desire that drives you to discontent and resent. And I want to unpack that just briefly so that we can know, like, What's really going on whenever we're not walking in discontentment? Discontent. So understand, coveting is not just about what you don't have. It's about what others have that you don't have. And coveting, understand what it does to us. It is a kill switch on our joy, on our generosity, and on our gratitude. Because when we are walking in coveting instead of contentment, we are entitled we feel like we are owed something more than we really are, and it produces the spirit of materialism, which is the air that we breathe. What is materialism? If I have more in my hand, then that's going to mean I've got more in my heart. But contentment says the opposite. More in my heart means I actually need less in my hand. But it also, what coveting does is it traps you in comparison where you go, my, my quality of life is now graded by what others have that I want that I don't. And this is why uh, social media is where we go to what's called doom scroll. We, we, we are doomed because there's always going to be somebody who has something that we don't, that we want. And that's where resentment comes in. It doesn't just stop as I want what you have. It's not only do, do I want more stuff, I, I'm going to resent the people who have the stuff that I want. And this is the kill switch on relationships because now we're embittered toward that person who has that thing that we don't. Now we're embattled toward that person who has that thing that we don't. And I've heard it said before, this, what this does is it keeps you locked in what's called the land of Ur. It's a bad place to be. Don't go here. And if, if you're there, get out of here. The land of Ur is everyone you see or someone you see, you're always focusing on someone stronger, prettier, wealthier, smarter, faster. That's the land of Ur. And it's not a place that, that we want to be. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm glad that, what a way to live, man. I'm like, glad we're not like that anymore, right? Glad that we, we can just walk in victory over this. Uh, today's big idea, here it is. We must turn from coveting and learn contentment. We must turn from coveting and learn contentment. And so when we open the Bible and hear from Paul, what we get is a master class on contentment. You see, Paul is a living portrait on being a person who's at peace with a lot, but he's also at peace with a little. And we know this because Philippians, what is it? It's one big thank you letter. Yeah, and, and you wonder, like, what reason does Paul have to be grateful? I mean, he's confined in prison, being guarded by a Roman soldier. He's in chains, and yet the biggest reason why he's thankful is because Jesus was enough for him. But then there's a bonus reason. It's because God faithfully provided for his needs through the Philippian church. There was a time when Paul was meeting the needs of the Philippians, but the Philippians turned right back around. And they put into practice, like we learned last week, what Paul taught them, and they ministered to his needs. And they heard about Paul's needs in prison, and they wanted to do something about it. And in chapter 2, we saw that they sent this guy named Epaphroditus, who had supplies. I mean, he had gifts 
And guys, it's nothing fancy right here. I mean, it's basic stuff. It's like some hygiene. It's, it's, mo- it's maybe uh, some ink uh, to write with, maybe some scrolls, uh, maybe a pillow, maybe a blanket, some food, all, all that just basic stuff. But that was huge for Paul because if you were in jail, you got nothing unless friends brought it to you. And I mean, we, we come unhinged when we don't get our Amazon orders on time. When, when the grocery pickup delivery person is lagging behind or got our order mixed up or we can't get our favorite takeout take or make that Bucky's pit stop. I mean, it's just like a very sad, sad day, right? The things that we would have a hard time without. But I mean, Paul, man, he's not talking about any of that. He's just talking about basic stuff. So how does Paul respond uh, to uh, all this? Well, verse 10, here's what he says. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have, inter- you have revived your concern for me. Revived your concern. So Paul planted Philippian, or the Philippian church 10 years prior. He's like, you guys are still thinking about me. It's like it's just come, I've come back up in your hearts. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. In other words, you guys are like, Paul's done so much for us. Like, what are we going to do for him? And here the opportunity comes up. And maybe you've been there. Maybe you're just like, I mean, you wanted to help someone, but you just weren't sure where to start. This is me every Christmas when it's time for me to buy a gift. I am the worst gift giver on the planet, and, but my wife is the best, so it worked out really well. Uh, but when you find out like what it is, you're just like, oh, that's going to cost me something. That's going to cost me some convenience if I'm going to actually meet that person's need. That was the Philippians, because when they first heard about Paul's imprisonment, they were deeply concerned. I mean, but think about it, they're 800 miles away from where Paul is in Rome. They're like, they're not just going to uh, Uber their way over there. Uh, I mean, it's going to take, uh, uh, it's, it's a journey. But I could see like Lydia and the jailer and maybe Euodia and Syntyche get over their little scuffle and they come together and they're like, what could we do to help Paul? And I want you to notice in verse 10 how it says, at length you have revived your concern for me. In other words, the Philippians did something that we're not very great at. Uh, it, it, they did kind of the opposite of what we tend to do. What we tend to do is we hear something sad that someone's going through. We have a, a brief moment of maybe passive sympathy, and then we just go on with our day. But the Philippians, they were, they were concerned, it says, at length, meaning they formed a plan, they created an opportunity, cost and convenience aside, what could we do? And someone in the church just stands up and says, here's a thought. Let's give Paul the very thing that he doesn't have, the two things he needs right now. He needs resources, and he needs relationships. Let's take up an offering for him. Let's go shopping for him. Hey, somebody's going to have to take about eight weeks off of work in order to get this to Paul. And then sure enough, Epaphroditus, he does it. He says, here I am, send me. And he makes the, the journey. He suffers greatly along the way, but he gets to Paul. And I just think you're like, oh, Epaphroditus, that's good for you. Well, where did he get that? He got that from Jesus. Because who traveled a long way, who went out of his way at great cost and convenience to himself and suffered greatly along the way in order to bring us relief? Well, that's the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so anytime we do this stuff, understand as Christians, we're just replaying, we're just mimicking what Christ has done for us first. Listen to how Paul relates to it all, verse 11. This is worth memorizing. Not that I am speaking of being in need... What a thing to say when you have so many needs. (laughs) He says, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So here's what he's saying in context. I rejoice that you did this, but I didn't ask you to do it. In fact, after all that I've walked through, God's grace and His peace uh, have never failed to sustain me. And even if you had not come... I'd be no less content. Isn't that powerful? And it, but he's also like, on the, on the other hand, he's like, don't get me wrong. I'm glad that you sent Epaphroditus because I'm in a more comfortable position. But even if not, verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. Don't we want to be around people who know how? Paul says, I know how. It's like he's saying, I've been there. I've been where you are. And he says, in any and every circumstance, I have, keyword, underline this, learned, learned the secret. He's like, not many people actually know this. It's a secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. 
And so he's going, I know what it's like to have it all, to lose it all, to be left with nothing at all, and somehow look up and go, Christ is all. And so if you think about it, Paul had it all. He actually talked about this in Philippians chapter 3, 4, 4 and 6. I'm going to summarize this, by the way. This was Paul in those verses. I had made it by the world's standards. If anyone thinks they had it better than me, I had it better than them. If anyone thinks they were better than me, I was better than them. And yet, Philippians 3, 7 follows that. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So what we see right here is that the essence of contentment is viewing Jesus as enough. And Paul says all of those accomplishments, all of those degrees, all those accolades, it was rubbish. It was, it was rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. And that's contentment. And that's how Paul could go to having it all to losing it all. Because, I mean, because think about it, he actually, he lost it all in the world's eyes. You look at Paul, you're like, that's a pitiful guy over there. And he indexes all of this in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25, when he talks about the unthinkable scope of suffering that he faced for the sake of Christ. I'm going to summarize these verses too for you. Here's basically what he says. I've worked harder than you. I've been unjustly imprisoned longer than you. I've suffered deeper than any of you. I've been shipwrecked, beaten, and stoned, slandered, hungry, and cold. Anybody else want to complain? <laughs> Anybody else gone through it like me? But with that, here's what he does. He writes some of the most famous words in human history. You would be hard-pressed to find a quote that has been more quoted anywhere in any form of literature than Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, I want to say that this verse has suffered great mishandling and misunderstanding at the hands of careless interpreters and careless Bible readers. And here's why. Because uh, in, in many ways, we tend to be more American than we do Christian when we read and interpret the Bible because we just focus on that first part. I can. And it's like the rest of it just falls off a cliff. I can do all things. Things. I'm an American, not an American't. So don't tell me that I can't do something. And um, uh, I'm sorry to pop your balloon, but this verse is not about you having what it takes. To say the plain thing, you don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes. But then Christ came. Christ has what it came. While we were sinners, dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with him, having canceled the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus has what it takes. And he has what it takes to lead us to repent of sin, to walk in victory, to be born again, to forgive, to forbear, to endure, to be content. So I got to say, this verse is not about you getting your way. It's not, and it's not about you being able to do uh, whatever, whatever you think that you should be doing or, or could do. Um, it's not about winning the football game. It's not about acing a test that you didn't study for. It's not about climbing some corporate la ladder. Like every other verse, the clarity is in the context. So here it is. I can, let's keep reading, do all things through him, say it with me, who strengthens me. Okay, now we're being careful Bible readers because this is more about what God can do in spite of you than it is what you can do in spite of God. Read rightly, here's the summary. This is the testimony of a content Christian life, by the way. I wonder, could we be humble enough to say this? Left to my own strength, I'm only content when I'm getting my way. But through Christ, who strengthens me, even when life doesn't go my way, I've learned to be content 
anyway. That's a fuller take on Philippians 4.13. That's what's being said right here. And I want to, here's what I want to do. I want to tell you the truth about contentment. I want to tell you the truth about contentment, and then I want to give you three ways that we can turn from, we can turn from coveting and we can learn contentment uh, for the rest of our time. So here's the truth about contentment. This is for, we get this basically from verses 10 through 13. Contentment must be learned. Contentment is not natural. No one is born content. Just look at babies who cry over anything. They're tired. They're hungry. They need a diaper change. And then that's just on repeat. Mostly for the rest of our lives, give or take one of those, maybe. And there's a, there, but there's, here's what's incredible is there's a positive side to the example of a child. I love the way that Tim Keller talks about how our goal in life should be to become like a weaned child. Because if you think about it, an unweaned child cries until it gets something from mom. But a weaned child can be content just with mom being in the room. And here's the question. Are you content with God simply being in the room? Is his presence and approval enough for you? Is that all you need for joy and contentment? Or does he have to come riding on reindeer like Santa Claus, bearing even more gifts than what he's already given for it to be enough and you not to throw a fit? Does he need to hand you the ideal outcome of the election? Do you need a $10,000 raise? Do you need a supermodel Spouse, well, it's tough to think about this because we aren't very good at this, right? (laughs) But help and hope can only come to those who embrace reality. Reality, what is it? It's what hits you when you realize you were wrong. And the Bible is the best source of reality that we could ever come to. How do we do that? How do we learn contentment? Well, three ways we do this. We turn and we learn. Let's talk about this idea of turning and learning. So, we, number one, this is verse 14, we learn contentment as we turn from coveting. So I want you to see this, that there is two times in verses 10 through 13, again, that Paul said that he learned contentment. He's like, guys, I've, I've, I've learned it. It's not that I stopped learning it, I'm still kind of learning it. I'm, I'm, getting a, you know, I'm getting a crash course over here in Rome. Don't get me wrong, but I've learned it to the point to where I know how to live it. And he had, to do that, he had to turn from coveting. And just understand, let's not be naive, that's not a painless process. Because our hearts are sinful, they're fallen, we, put thing, we want things more than God, we put things before God. And here's the thing about desires. I think this is one of the misconceptions about Christianity and why some people just reject it altogether. It's because we think that when we come to Christ, our desires just have to be shut down. And that's actually not, not the case. Our, our desires are actually awakened. But here's the thing about desires. Uh, We have sinful desires, and we want to pursue righteous desires, and here's how it works. Desires are not erased. They must be replaced. Now, let me give you an example of this. Whenever I turned from sin and trusted fully and finally in Jesus as my king, I had been listening to music. I had been filling my mind with music that was horrible for my mind, horrible for my heart came out in my actions. I just was, I, you know, from like 10 to like 19, I had just been pumping my mind with this explicit rap music and hip hop. And it was, there was a lot of violence. There was just a lot of objectifying females. There was a lot of idolizing possessions. And I had just pumped my mind with that. And now I'm a Christian and it's like, what do I do about that? Because I didn't just stop enjoying that music. Even to this day, I can hear a beat or I can hear a song and I still enjoy it because there was something, but it's different. It it has been, it's not been erased, it's replaced. The grace of God visited me and he animated my desires. He redeemed them so that he's not like, Jeremy, stop listening to music. He's like, I got better music for you. And he gave me an appetite for worship music. I, I found this guy, Lecrae, and I discovered like Christian hip-hop 
And it just like, God wasn't taking something from me. He was get, giving something better to me that actually pleased him and was good for me. Here's how this works. We turn from coveting, not as we erase our desires, but as we learn to enjoy new and better desires. This is Psalm 37, 4, worth memorizing. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you what you really want. He will give you the desires of your heart. And Paul, here's what's interesting, in Romans 7, verses 7 through 9, he actually said that what actually convicted and convinced him that he was a guilty sinner was the command, you shall not covet. Because he kind of checklisted all of the others, and he's like, I'm, I'm doing pretty good right there. But then he comes to you shall not covet, and he's like, busted. Because there, there was a time when his focus was on all he didn't have, and he was living a selfish life, and this was like the mirror that was staring right back at him saying, you're guilty. And so another way that we turn from coveting, here's, here it is, is how it happened for Paul, is we take our eyes off what we don't have and we put it on what others don't have. This is the shift from coveting to gospel contentment. And we know Paul had learned and was learning contentment because he was the one who taught the Philippians how to do this, and it shows up in verse 14. Take a look. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. What he's saying is you guys are practicing what you learned from me. Get your eyes off what you don't have and learn to look at what others don't have and look at what God's given you and see how you might meet a need. You see, the Philippians, they learned this from Paul, but where did Paul learn this? He learned it from Christ. And it's why he says, let this mind be in you, not that was in Paul, but that was in Christ Jesus. And what does Christ do for us? 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxieties, cast all your discontentment on me because I care for you. Isn't it amazing that he's so good that he cares for us, but he's so great that he can carry stuff that we can't? And just that, those verses we were reading earlier, he says because of that, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 is also true. Here's the great invitation, come to me. All you who are overwhelmed, all you who are overworked, uh, Come to me, give me that burden, because I can carry it, and I'm going to give you rest. This is why he says in Mark 10, 45, hey, I'm not, I'm not focused on what I could insist on in this moment for myself. He, he says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to share in your trouble and to give his life as a ransom for many. How good is he? Number two, we learn contentment as we turn to generosity. This is going to come in verses 15 through 17. Let's take a look. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, that was when the gospel first came to the Philippians, when I left Macedonia, those Macedonia, think of it, it's kind of like the state. It's like a state. So if ancient Greece was the country, then Macedonia was the state. And in that state, there was three big cities. There was uh, Philippi, there was Thessalonica, and there was Berea. It's all recorded in Acts 16 through 17. But he says, in Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving. So I do want to be clear, he's talking about financial partnership right here. He said, except you only. So verse 16, even in Thessalonica, who did not give, by the way, who did not partner with me, <laughs> by the way, he doesn't say that, but it's there, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So I just want to connect the dots for our church a little bit right here because there, there is a deep connection for our church to, to these verses right here. Because when a church is getting started, she's usually very slow to give. And because of that, other churches can be called upon to make the difference. So, for example, when, when Victoria and I uh, said, yes, we're going to pick up our lives and we're going to move from Asheville, North Carolina to uh, Conway, South Carolina to see what the Lord may do through starting Coastway. Here's kind of how it went. I had to swallow my pride and I go and go to churches with some version of this. Hey, we are moving our lives to a spiritually underserved and underdiscipled region with great need for the gospel. However, it's going to take a lot of financial support to make it possible. And we don't know who will give or how long it will take for people to give enough for the church to be established. And so I asked the question, will you give to cover the gap until we are established? 
and praise be to God, there were 14 churches who said, we will cover the gap. Coastway Church wouldn't exist without those churches. That's why I share this. We wouldn't be here. It was because of churches like Philippi being like that to a church like ours that we are here today. And three years into this whole learning contentment through generosity, we've made great progress. Holistically, we are a very generous church. We've got more progress to make. And I just want to say, if you're new to Coastway or you're just checking things out, um, fine for you to know this, but I'm not really talking to you just yet. And that's partly because the reason that Philippi gave their hard-earned money to Paul's ministry was because they had benefited from Paul's ministry. And so we try to be very aware of this when we call anyone to be generous. And so it kind of goes like this when we're calling to be stewards and generous. It's if the ministry of Coastway is adding value to your life, will you respond by adding value back to the ministry of Coastway? And this is important because of what Paul says in verse 15. He says, giving and receiving. He doesn't just say receiving. He says, he says both. And in our modern moment, there's a lot of people who just do one of those. I, I, I just come and I expect to receive. I'm going to come sit for an hour. I'm going to get free child care. I'm going to hear the truth of God's word taught. I'm going to benefit from community. I'm going to be led and worship and rinse and repeat and receive, but not give. I, I, here's all I want to say about that is that's just not a good way. That's not a way to actually learn contentment. Instead, we ought to go, I want to see all the good that's coming to me come to others, and I want to give for the sake of one more person who could benefit like I've benefited. I've heard it said before, money is like manure. Stack it up and it stinks Spread it around and it makes things grow. It's true. And here's what's so amazing. Verse 17, Paul says, Not that I seek the gift. Again, let me remind you, I didn't ask for this. Uh, I would have been no less content had you not given. But I seek the fruit that, here's the phrase to latch on to, increases to your credit. This is why we give. Because what Paul is saying is this is not about what God needs from you. It's about what God wants for you. This is amazing. Because when you give to the work of ministry, not only are you learning contentment, you get a share of the credit. I'll use our church as an example. Because of your generosity, those of you who give faithfully, CCU students are being effectively engaged, established, and equipped as disciples of Jesus. One student who we baptized earlier this year, greatly benefiting from community group, from gatherings, said this in a group chat. Hey, y'all, I just wanted to say that recently I have made a major milestone in my journey with Jesus. There are certain struggles I have been going through for a while, and now with the help of our King, those struggles and temptations, get this, have become more bearable and easier to battle. Amen. I have also been blessed with more courage to confess my faith to people who have extremely opposing views. So when you give to that, you get credit for that. Because you give, we're in a position to minister like this. Also, because of your generosity, we were able to give $10,000 to those who were impacted and affected by the hurricane that swept away Western North Carolina, uh, some of our hometown. That's where Victoria and I grew up. And those dollars right now are going to work to meet not just felt needs with homes and water and power, but forever needs helping people hear the gospel. And by giving to the kingdom through Coastway, you can say, I played a role in that. And so when Paul says, hey, being generous increases to your credit, what he's saying is you're accruing interest eternally. And this is what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 6.20, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. That's That's not a good ROI. Store up treasures in heaven because that's where you accrue true interest. And how amazing is it going to be? Heaven's going to be better than you think. How amazing is it going to be when there's someone from Western North Carolina who you've never met who comes up to you in heaven and says, thank you. When there's a CCU student who you never really interacted with who comes up and says, thank you. Jesus saved me. And you're giving enabled so much of that to happen. 
I want to say two more things about this. First, what's the relationship between contentment and generosity? Well, let me make this as simple as I can. When you're coveting, you're not content. I think it bears repeating, you're focused on what you don't have. But when you're content, you're focused not only on what you do have, but what on others don't have, which tees you up to actually live the Christian life and do the very thing Paul said in Philippians 2, 3 through 4, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Count others more significant than yourself. And that's why walking in generosity is how you learn contentment. It's no exaggeration to say that it is not possible to learn contentment and neglect generosity. Second, how can we commit to learning contentment as a church? Well, here's a simple phrase that uh, summarizes all, basically the Bible's teaching on, on all this. It's give to honor God, save to be wise, live on the rest to teach yourself contentment. Give to honor God, save to be wise, live on the rest to teach yourself contentment. And so when it comes to being generous and honoring God, a great way to do that around Coastway is like, are you guys into tithing? Are you going to tell me I need to give 10%? It's like, well, I, actually, if we want to go there, what, would, a, would a Jew under the law be more generous than a Christian under grace? So if you want to play that Old Testament card, it's just some food for thought. But actually what we do is we say, would you be a C3 giver? Would you give in ways that are consistent? So you're going to be consistently content uh, in a way that's costly, you're, con- you're, you're saying Jesus is enough for me so I can actually sacrifice with this. And will you give from a cheerful heart? Consistent, costly, and cheerful. That is our, our language on generosity around here. And anytime, I want to say, anytime we see someone in our church take time to set up recurring giving or giving regularly in person on your way out in some way, we rejoice for three reasons. And they might surprise you what these reasons are. Number one, this person is serious about learning contentment, and we know it. Number two, this person is benefiting from the ministry of our church. Praise God. And number three, this person now gets a portion of the credit for all the good. Now, going into the Christmas season, we want to learn contentment. Because rarely is there a time of the year where we are more tempted to covet And let me just go ahead and call the play. Amazon does not want you to be content. Target does not want you to be content. Home Depot does not want you to be content. Home Goods does not want you to be content. No, they don't. They they have a wonderful vision for your finances, and it was that you would remain coveting, covetous. Like, what do I not have? They don't want you to learn this, but Jesus does want you to learn this. And we as the church have a responsibility to create opportunities for us to learn this. And that's why we are doing what's called a year-end overflow offering. I want to tell you about this. This is not a substitute for regular giving. This is a supplement. This is just saying, just because. This is me saying, I want to go above and beyond. And so what we're doing is we're going to take a year-end above and beyond offering called overflow and it's going to go three ways. Uh, first of all, it's going to go to Gateway Church in Western North Carolina, uh, a church that's uh, a part of the same collaborative of church plants that we are, who is ministering and pastoring and impacting a community that was completely swept away, not just with felt needs, but also forever needs. I talked to Pastor Brody Medford. Pray for him. Pray for Brody. Uh, it's been a very difficult time. And when I called and I just, after just kind of talking with our finance team and Praying through this, it's just like this. He was o- overwhelmed with generosity that we were going to do this. So a third of the offering is going to go to Gateway Church. A third of the offering is going to go to Coastline Women's Center. There are a lot of women who have a very hard choice to make. And we want to fund a local agency that's committed to helping women to choose life for their un- unborn baby dealing with an unplanned pregnancy. And so... is going to go to Coastline Women's Center doing great work. And 33% is going to go to help us close the gap on our budget and end the year strong. We are 82% of the way there, guys. We can do it. 
But what's a strategic way for us to finish strong? Is just for this offering to be a way that we do it. And another way that we're going to do this is with uh, the Blackwater Bear Tree. So what's the bear tree? Well, the bear tree, it's like an angel tree, except you get to provide Christmas for a student at Blackwater Middle School who otherwise wouldn't get it. So we, our name is on 25 students who otherwise wouldn't get Christmas, and these cards, the, these decorations, they're, gonna, they're on the tree outside when you walk. They'll be there next Sunday, the next two Sundays. Uh, we're going to provide Christmas for 25 Blackwater students, and we're going to take those, and there's like a tear-off so you can put your name on it, so if you don't do this, we can hunt you down because the unforgivable sin is for you to go out and take one of these and not return it and give Christmas to these kids. Amen. By the witness of the Holy Spirit, we speak the truth. <laughs> We learn contentment as we turn to generosity. And lastly, we learn contentment as we turn to gratitude. This is the point that I'm most excited to preach today because I feel like it's just so close to what, what God has been teaching me personally. Here in, here in just a few weeks, what's going to happen? We're going to eat too much. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, Thanksgiving, all right? It's, it's coming, and uh, it's a time where we pause to thank God for the good. And can I just point out how... It's amazing how quickly gratitude can be sucked out of our hearts by the rhythms of modern life. Because right after the prayers are said, the turkey is finished, the leftovers are packed, here comes Black Friday. Here comes Cyber Monday. Here comes these curated ads. How did you know I needed undershirts? You watching me? Seriously. And it's all to suck us right back into the toxic air of coveting. And we have to actively resist it. Because gratitude, a secret about gratitude, is it's more than a moment, it's a muscle. And if you don't exercise it, it weakens over time. And uh, so in, here's a way to think about it. In terms of strength, if coveting were Mike Tyson, then Paul would be Jake Paul. He's at a point in his exercise of gratitude where he's not about to be beat. And I'm glad that 50% of the room got that. <laughs> Verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Guys, it's basic stuff, again, remember. It doesn't take much to make a grateful person even more grateful. And Paul sees it as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. What he's saying right there is the way you gave is not just helpful to me, it's pleasing to God. Ungrateful people don't give. And they certainly don't give like this is what he's saying. And so there's so much against us. How do we do this? Well, let me, let me talk about how we turn to gratitude. Uh, number one, we turn to gratitude by focusing on what God has given you. So I want you to look at verse 18. Notice how Paul starts. What does he say? I have received. What have you received that you're taking for granted? That you're just feeling like, well, God, you owed that to me. Well, Paul does none of that. He's not taking anything for granted. <laughs> And I want to I show you guys, there's a really cool resource that um, was actually innovated by a friend of mine. It's called the Graticube. Um, it's an interactive way to exercise the muscle of gratitude as a family. You can do this as a community group. You can do this with your spouse. And basically, um, the way you exercise the, the muscle of gratitude is by introducing something that's good, right, and beautiful into a moment or conversation. And so... Uh, you could take like, and here's, these are the examples that show up. You might not be able to read that, but just get your phone if your eyes are kind of bad like mine and you can zoom in a little bit. It's cool what they can do with technology. And uh, take a picture of this because it's like uh, an experience from your day, something in your life or something from your past. And I'm actually, I'm going to model this just kind of in real time. And uh, you, it's, it's a cube and it's got all these prompts on it. I'm going to roll it and see uh, something in nature. Love the beach. We like to go to the beach on Sunday evenings, by the way. Uh, something that made you smile. We're decorating for Christmas right now, okay? It's not too soon. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> you Grinch? <laughs> um, and uh, we get out these uh, big bags. They're, they're red. And we've got all this like artificial holly in it. If This made me smile. And Elliot goes in there and he grabs some and he goes, Muscles! <laughs> so that, that made me smile. Uh, food. Smoked chicken wing. Don't forget about that. Made you smile. There we go. Uh, something accomplished. Uh, preaching through the book of Philippians. Amen. Uh, a difficult time. Whew, wow. Um, it's when, uh, when God spared 
Eleanor and Elliot, soon after they were born, and the enemy tried to take both of them. Uh, something special to you, uh, my Ember coffee mug. So you're like, I like this. Well, you can get yours. Go to goodkind.shop. By the way, community group leaders, yours is on the way to help you lead the way. Goodkind.shop. Enjoy that. Other good ways to do this, writing a thank you note. Artificial intelligence can't do that for you, by the way. Listing your blessings as well. So turn to gratitude by focusing on what you do have. Number two, turn to gratitude by trusting in what God will give to you. Verse 19, look at this. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So this, understand this promise, like Philippians 4.13, it was not given, like it's not given just at face value. It wasn't given to every church. It's a condition. It's like if then promise. If you learn contentment through generosity and gratitude, which Paul and the Philippians were doing, then God will more assuredly provide for you. That's what he's saying right here. It doesn't say that God won't if you don't if you're, if you're ungrateful or not generous, it, Jesus said he would take care of his own regardless of the quality of our faith. But apparently there's an extra special reward reserved for those who learn contentment. It's as if God is saying, since you trust that I am enough, I will reward you with more than enough. Verse 20. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus, even the ones you don't like we got a few of those in the family. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Here's the key word. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So he ends the key word grace. That's what I want you to see. He ends by talking about grace because we can do none of this without grace. Paul knew that every member of the church at Philippi would need grace to walk in contentment, to live what he wrote. And that's because most of us have a very circumstantial relationship with peace. Well, what do we do? Well, we go around and we punish others. We resent God when whatever we feel entitled to is not given to us or for some reason taken from us. And the book of Philippians, thank God for it, because it calls us beyond that. It calls us above that. It reminds us of our shared need for grace and our quest for peace. And the very grace that teaches us contentment is exclusively and abundantly available in Jesus. If you think back to the story of how Victoria's love for me was possible due to a content heart, how much more was Jesus' love for needy, guilty sinners possible than because he had a content heart. You see, when we look to Jesus, we see the greatest example of contentment. I mean, think about his life. He went from rich to poor. He didn't have to do that, but then he went from poor to rich. And what was the constant throughout throughout all of that? It was a content heart. And because he was content, he didn't come to take what we have. He came to give what he had. And coveting, it says, I must have what you have, but the gospel says, you must have what I have. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Would you bow your heads and open your hearts? I want to invite our care team forward. And as our care team comes forward, I just want to ask you, is there an area in your heart where maybe you need to work on this a little bit? Is there an area where peace is escaping you? Or maybe there's someone you know who you see this going on in their life and you just want to seek prayer for them. If so, without hesitation or reservation, come forward and be cared for. That's what the church is for. Be prayed for, be cared for, receive ministry. And I'm going to pray for us all. And then we're going to move, we're going to respond, we're going to sing, Lord God, teach us contentment. Your word says that godliness with contentment is great gain. It's almost like we could live what feels like a godly life without contentment. But it's with contentment that we have great gain. 
So, so Lord, w- would you go to work in our hearts? And would you help us turn from coveting? Would you help us to focus on what we do have and what you have promised that you will provide for those who look to you for strength? Lord, show us how to be generous. Show us, show us how to be gratitude, how to be grateful. And Lord, we thank you for this message. We thank you for Philippians. We thank you for this journey of joy. In Jesus' name, amen.